Well, let me do a little quick poll here, a little audience participation. What percentage of you trust either completely or somewhat a recommendation that you get from a peer or friend when it comes to, you know, a place to eat, a movie to watch, a book to read? What percent of you trust somewhat or completely a peer? What does that look like? Almost everybody. You kind of were a little, you're a little reluctant there, but depending on your belief how credible that source is, you might trust them for a restaurant recommendation, right? But you might not trust them for a recommendation about a car, right? So it is truly, the, the level of trust truly depends on the source. Would you like to see if uh, your response was close to the Nielsen data on that question? Let's take a look. 90% of consumers trust their peers. That's a very high percentage. In fact, by far, that is the highest percentage of multiple different sources of information. We all trust our peers significantly more than marketers or brands, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, there's a little company over here in Mountain View that has made a hell of a lot of money by selling search advertising. I can't remember the name of that company. <laughs> they don't seem to be very relevant right now, but they do have a hell of a lot of cash. Well, they sell search ads, and they created that category, invented search advertising. And what percentage of you trust those ads that you see on that right-hand side or on the top? What percentage of you trust that somewhat or completely? Nobody? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, now that's, those there are two kinds of uh, responses, uh, results that you get. There's organic results, right? And then there are paid results. And the paid results are the ones that go down the right-hand column and then across the top. Do you trust that? You don't trust them? Okay. What about the rest of you guys? How many of you trust that completely or somewhat? Not many people. Trust, trust I mean, I think, uh, as Nielsen asked it, do you find this to be a credible source of information? That would you act on the recommendation? Do you believe it's uh, honest? You know, they tr do you either trust it completely or somewhat or not at all? Would you like to see what uh, the survey said? <laughs> I, sound, I feel like Richard Dawson here. And the survey said... Only 49% of consumers trust search ads. Yeah. But here's the funny thing about it. Any, anybody here in marketing? Do you uh, buy search advertising, paid search? Yeah, you, you, that is the 800-pound gorilla these days in the marketing category. Nearly every company spends money on paid search, but half of the people reading it don't trust it. Well, we all get emails, right? get emails from friends, but we get a lot of emails from companies and brands. And we want to take a guess what percentage of people trust emails from the company or the brand? 7%. Any other guesses? Now let's take a look at what the survey said. Only 28%, according to Forrester, trust email from a company or a brand. But nearly every company that markets a product or service relies a heck of a lot on email to get its message out to its target audience. Most people don't trust it. The mails that you opt in for, the trust is significantly higher. And, you know, emails from someone you know is actually quite high. But this is just email from the company or a brand. Some people call that spam, by the way. Now, any fans of the show Mad Men, right? The golden era of advertising. I'm in the marketing business, and, you know, I don't know how these people drink, like, three martinis a day and carry on. If I had a martini at noon, I'd be asleep by 1 o'clock. Advertising has been generally discredited in this era, and online advertising in particular. But uh, there's a heck of a lot of money being spent still on online advertising. But guess what? People don't trust it. Only 33% people trust online advertising. All right, so forget about paid media. I'm a blogger, you know. People trust me. <laughs> Do you trust bloggers? Well, only 18% in this survey by Nielsen trust bloggers. So uh, do we have any bloggers here? And we've got Mashable and TechCrunch and Gawker and on and on and on that wield a supposedly tremendous influence and power. Do they really? 90% of you trust each other. Only 18% of you trust bloggers. Okay, well, you know what? We're going to start a company blog. We have one at Zubrance. We've got something important to contribute to the discussion. We'd, we'd like to put our point of view out there. And we're a credible company. 
Uh, we try to do the right thing every day, and we think we've got some interesting things to share about uh, word-of-mouth marketing and social media. Let's see how much people trust. Uh, Kara's one of our bloggers. I hate to let you down, Kara. Only 16% of people trust corporate blogs. So let's go start a corporate blog. <laughs> you know, I, we're a word-of-mouth marketing company. How do we get the word out? Well, we use word-of-mouth marketing, but you know all these billboards on 101? I thought we ought to run a billboard that would advertise for word-of-mouth marketing, and here's what I wanted it to say. <laughs> but 90% of you trust word-of-mouth. In fact, word-of-mouth is the number one driver of sales for every product category that you see up here, and more. When you bought a car last time, I bet you asked your friends or people that drive that car, what do you think? What's, uh, what's up with Toyota? I mean, are they fixing these cars? I'm seeing these ads, but can I trust what they say? Uh, it's uh, in hotel category. The hotel category has been revolutionized by something called TripAdvisor. How many people uh, go to TripAdvisor before you book a hotel room? Or a similar, Hotels.com. It has revolutionized the world, the world of hotel marketing. In every category, nearly every category, word of mouth is the most trusted, incredible, and influential source of information. In fact, uh, McKinsey says that two-thirds of the U.S. economy is driven by word of mouth. So this is not a sideline activity. Now, I don't know what that number is. Um, the, the young lady who spoke before me was a power consultant at one time. <laughs> so I don't know, two-thirds of the U.S. economy mean, you know, trillions of dollars of goods and services are purchased on the basis of a word-of-mouth recommendation. Uh, in fact, uh, there are 4.5 billion conversations each and every day in the United States in which a brand is mentioned, 4.5 billion conversations. That's a lot of word-of-mouth. Now, Forrester... Uh, you guys familiar with Forrester Research? Uh, recently tried to analyze how much word of mouth is going on on the social web. And this is what they concluded, is that in the U.S., that's the number of word of mouth impressions each and every day. And then how many people, you know, we're all on Facebook, we're tweeting. Now, each time a consumer posts something on the social web, Forrester came up with an estimate of how many people are reached every time a consumer posts something on the social web. And the number they came up with was 150. That's each and every time, right? And they consider that estimate low. Does that sound like a lot to you, 150? Why do you think it's, it seems conservative or does not, it seems low and not exaggerated? Or do, you, do you use Twitter? And probably things that you tweet get retweeted, right? Yeah, this is the viral nature of social media. In fact, according to Forrester, the reach of online word of mouth now rivals advertising. On average, according to Facebook, most people have, well, let me ask it as a question. What do you guys think is the number of average friends that people have on Facebook? Average number. What do you think? You were right on. It's 130, according to uh, Facebook. How, ma how many friends do you have on Facebook, Kara? How many? A thousand. So the reach of social media... Uh, has now become a true force for people to think about, to consider, and to try to take advantage of, frankly, from a marketing standpoint, because it now rivals advertising. So now, let's talk a little bit about social media and trust in social media. So I'm, I'm a person that does look at TripAdvisor a lot when I go to book a hotel, and it turns out that, the, and I actually do uh, find the reviews very helpful, and now you can post pictures of your hotel, and, and so let's take a look at what the survey says here. According to Nielsen, 70% trust online reviews, 70%. Now, I've seen this number bounce around a little bit. I've seen it as low as 50%, as high as 72 or 74%. Whether that's on Amazon or CNET or Yelp or on TripAdvisor, people, you, all of us, consumers, put a lot of faith in those reviews. Yes? They're now going to be reviews on LinkedIn. LinkedIn just uh, bought a company that was a reviews company, and they're going to start. They want to, they want to become sort of the Amazon of B2B. So now you're not just having friends, but uh, 
you know, not just colleagues and contacts, but you can review vendors and products. Well, the, the, according to Nielsen, when they did the survey, 70% of the people that they interviewed said that they found the online reviews credible, believable, worthwhile as an important source of information. But now somebody said this to me the other day that when he reads online reviews on TripAdvisor, the first thing he does is looks at all the negative reviews. And then he feels like, you know, I, I got to see the worst thing that people can say about this hotel. Do you guys do that also? Do you read the, the negative ones first? And then you kind of discount the, the five-star reviews because you kind of feel like the, do you do that? But, you know, we're, uh, uh, <laughs> that's true, you know. Like, my food was cold, I'll get you for that. <laughs> Well, let's take a look a little bit more on this. Since hot hotels are such a hot category for reviews, let's take a look at reviews in the hotel space. According to Deloitte & Touche, another one of those other power consulting firms, 77% of travelers rely on reviews. It's actually all travelers rely on reviews. Before you book a hotel, before you go to a uh, resort, you're going to read these reviews and rely on them to provide some real, real, the real thing, some real information. But now look at what happens. This is a very interesting chart. You see what happens uh, now. If a hotel has a three-star review, 29% are more likely to stay at that hotel, to book a room at that hotel. But look what happens if the hotel has a five-star review. 92% of people said they're more likely to stay at that hotel if they have a five-star review. So in our business, we try to calculate for companies the value of positive word of mouth. And it's enormous. It's enormous. You know, with every additional positive review that gets published, more business comes to your doors. So uh, I would say it's pretty important if you, you know, if you want to get more business in your doors, get more people to spread positive word of mouth about you. As long as it's transparent and honest and you're not paying for it, why not? Did you have a thought about this? Because you were, was this resonating with you? That, yeah, very much. Yeah. And look at that, on the other hand, only 26% of people are likely to stay at a hotel if they have a one-star review. So you said as long as it's positive and honest, how do we as you know, viewers of this kind of review on the web know that it wasn't just paid for by the company? We don't. That's the problem. That's right. That's a problem. And I, I do think personally, and I've seen this in our own businesses, that as the noise increases in this reviews category, I think what people are doing now, they're saying, okay, I see what the reviews say, but let me, let me come over here and talk to my friend and find out the real story. You would think that at some point there's going to be a saturation point where you really don't know. There are a thousand negative reviews, a thousand positive reviews. You wonder about the source if someone's getting paid or who got a uh, free trip to write a review like that. It's a, it's a big problem. And the review companies are, are doing things now to try to give you more information about who is actually writing these reviews. Well, I was just wondering, in your experience, um, and certainly one of the things I think is kind of consistent with human nature is that we react and we like to tell people about a negative experience, much more so than a positive one. Mm -hmm. You know, I might have had a great meal, but that's kind of part of course with other great meals I've had that week. If I've had a negative meal, I'm much more likely to spread the word that, God, I went to this place, I really didn't enjoy it, mm -hmm. really terrible about expectations, and I might be then much more likely to actually write a review that's going to be a negative, negative in nature. Yeah. How in, in 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 these statistics are you kind of waiting the you know I think some of the, the uh, drivers behind how we like to communicate about our experiences and that typically we're much more likely to communicate maybe seven times as much about a negative experience than mm -hmm. a positive one. Well, let me. That's a very good point. Let me ask. Uh, how more likely would you all be to go to Yelp and write a review about a restaurant if you had a negative experience versus a positive experience? So. If you're more likely to write a review on Yelp based on a negative experience, raise your hand. Uh, based on a positive experience, how much more likely? Well, that's pretty close, but let me share with you some interesting data. According to Keller Fay, a word-of-mouth research firm, that they found that in offline word-of-mouth, 64% of word-of-mouth conversations about brands are actually positive rather than negative. And according to Yelp, uh, on average, by about a six-to-one margin, the reviews are positive on Yelp. And I started thinking about that. How is that, especially in the offline world? And you know what I think it is? You know when you go back to work on Monday and people go, what did you do this weekend? People don't like to be the bearer of bad news. 
they're more apt to say, oh, we went to a wonderful <laughs> restaurant, or we went to see a great movie, or we, uh, we went to a great new winery uh, on a wine tasting. It's just, I think it's more likely that you, people sort of want to engage at a positive level than being, uh, you know, sort of the dark cloud spreading ill will. Maybe it's the American optimistic spirit, but Keller Fay is a leading word of mouth research firm whose studies is called Talk Track. They study word of mouth in the offline world and they follow conversations the way Nielsen follows TV ratings. And they said, in fact, most word of mouth is positive. Isn't that interesting? That's right, especially if you have your name attached to it or you're having that conversation in person, you're probably more likely to write about, say, a stay at a hotel or a meal at a restaurant, what, within the first, what would you think, couple or three days? Because after that, it probably, that experience, I mean, you're on to other stuff. It could, but, you know, the, the data that I've seen is that the online reviews are mostly positive, just as offline word of mouth is mostly positive as well. So there is a popular perception that uh, there are a lot of negative reviews online. In fact, you know, there are. But the, but according to the, you know, you go read what Amazon says and what others, that most of the reviews that they get are actually positive reviews. So whether it's online or offline, word of mouth seems to be mostly positive. We may remember more and feel more compelled to write a review if you had an awful experience, but I'm talking about overall, the tone of it is mostly positive. This piece of data caused uh, seismic waves in the worlds of social media and word of mouth and adventure-backed companies like mine. Because I am the CEO and founder of a word of mouth marketing platform company. And it's really based on this notion that we all trust each other more than marketers, which I believe. So Edelman has a thing called the Trust Barometer. And every year they issue their research findings on the Trust Barometer. And what got all the headlines this year is that this uh, sacred cow called Peer Recommendations looks like it took a big hit in terms of the number of people who say their friends and peers are credible sources of information. Look at that bottom line. In blue is 2008, and in uh, kind of mustard orange is 2010. And... What a whopping decrease in two years' time. You see, can everybody see that, the point we're trying to make here? Now, and then I started reading a, a blogger, and he said, yeah, but wait a minute, that got the headline, but look at everything else. Everything else got clobbered. Now we don't trust the TV news, we don't trust radio news, we don't trust newspapers. Hell, we don't even trust our friends and peers anymore. <laughs> what the hell can you trust? <laughs> well... Why is that? I mean, if this is true, now I want to see another couple of years of data before we can all conclude that peer networks aren't trustworthy, but why, what's happening here? Yeah, uh, go ahead, uh, please, and then I'll come back, yeah. Oxytocin, stress. <laughs> We're all stressed, recession. This is exactly the expected, so my work would predict that in two years this will be back up. Okay, so what did you, what did, what did you attribute this phenomenon to? I'm suffering from that. <laughs> what, what would you what were you say? <laughs> All right. But understand, this is talking about the trust that you have in your peers and friends. It's not even an online review. It's whether I trust my BFF. Is that the right term, Karen? All right. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know you will. So has the definition of friend changed due to social media? Now a friend is just someone you may be connected with on LinkedIn. Yeah, maybe we need a different word. Now, this is, there I have my friends, but then I have my real friends. And among those real friends, I've got one friend I really trust. And the rest, <laughs> the rest tolerate me. <laughs> it's all good, don't worry. So, uh, the marketers have started uh, encouraging us to manipulate our, our statements on social media. Hmm. Tweet this in order to qualify for a drawing for a free iPad. And so, so I see tweets from 10 of my friends, word for word the same. I'm going to discount all of them. Mm. You know, has that happened to you? It has. But uh, they're a friend. They're and, uh, a friend. But, but they're, yeah. they're, they're trying to get into a drawing. And they're thinking, oh, it's harmless, one little tweet. But then when, you're, when your you know, time, time stream fills up with this garbage, mm -hmm. you discount all of it. Yeah. Um, so I think people are, are being manipulated... <laughs> 
you know, perhaps with good intentions by these marketers, and and uh, and so you have to question even things that your close friends. That's exactly what this uh, research is saying, I think, right? Or thank you, for that. You think it's, it's the information about companies from all those sources, right? Because that is a, thank you for pointing that out, because it, it does say information about companies, but I have to look at that research a little bit more because it might be, you know, uh, Alan, right? We were talking about restaurants, and he was raving about French Laundry and a few other places. We were sharing restaurant recommendations. Now, that is a company, the French Laundry, right? So it could be not just like Halliburton as a company, but, you know, the French Laundry as a company or Carr and Farrell as a company, et cetera, right? But that's it. I'm glad you pointed that out. And I think, I mean, what the blogger said was, let's not, you know, because this was the headline. I mean, this made a lot of headlines, right? People don't trust their friends and peers as much as they did two years ago. People don't trust anything as much as they did two years ago. And I bet, now, I have looked at some data from the 1960s and 1970s. We trusted everything much more. Now we trust very little. Great conversation, by the way. Well, um, here's the thing, is that we're wary of spams and scam on Facebook. So this is uh, the point that Gordon was making here, is that how much of that content that's being posted on Facebook is authentic. You know, who's shilling? Who's getting paid? Who's astroturfing? Who's pimping? But you have to like it in order to get that access. If uh, you're trying to figure out how do you communicate with your customers and your prospects in a world uh, racked by lack of trust, um, I can help you. That's me. Thanks.